Welcome to the masterclass on DNA and RNA extractions. My name is Vane Costa and I'm a member of the technical services team at Oxford and Alport Technologies. This masterclass is part of a series to help you achieve the best possible results. So we are here to walk you through from sample to answer with a series of masterclasses uh, to help you prepare your samples, sequence, and analyze. And this one in particular focuses on how to extract high quality nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA. With this masterclass, you should be able to um, know what to take into account when choosing the right extraction method for you, uh, which steps are included on high quality DNA and RNA, processing, how to optimize every single step in order to achieve your goals and the best practices to handle DNA and RNA. So there are a few things you need to consider uh, before you get started. So you might be familiar with this from the How to Get Started Masterclass. And this is because people often, uh, when they think about the workflow, they think about the raw sample all the way to the answer. But this is actually a two-way street. So you need to think which type of data you need to generate to answer your questions and then work backwards. Because the data you need to generate uh, will, will depend on the library preparation method you use and on the extraction method as well. So for instance, if you want to do, let's say an assembly and you want to generate really long data, you need to have a library preparation method that will allow you to have those really long fragments by the end of the library, but you also need an extraction method that will provide you those really long fragments. And before that, you need a well-preserved sample that is not degraded and will have those long fragments. So you need to think first about the type of data you need to generate and then work backwards. And there are several things you need to think about, not just the read length distribution, so that the size of the fragments, but also uh, the sequencing depth, how much, how much data you need to generate. And all of that will have an impact on the library preparation and on the extraction as well. So there are things you need to define before you start your extractions, before you get your hands uh, on the lab. Um, the first one is the starting amount. So you need to know how much DNA or RNA you're going to need for the library preparation. So for instance, uh, if you are using our ligation sequencing kit, the standard input amount is one microgram. But if you are using our ultra long kit, the standard input amount is 40 micrograms. So obviously you need to generate much more uh, DNA if you are working with an ultra long kit. However, we do have other options. If you have lower input amounts, we have kits that, are, um, that were developed to handle uh, lower inputs as well. But it's important for you to define what you need at first because uh, that might have an implication on the extraction method you choose. And then you also need to ensure your samples have been stored correctly, especially if you want to look at, at long fragments, you need to ensure that you have those long fragments to start with so that you have them in your raw sample and that those are carried uh, all the way through the extraction. And um, you want to avoid any sort of degradation, both with DNA and RNA. Then you need to consider which sample type you have, because you, you have extraction methods that can extract a variety of samples, but then you have other samples that are very, very specific and that require a very specific uh, extraction method, like for instance, FFP or cell-free DNA. And then there are samples that naturally contain some contaminants, like uh, for instance, plants. Uh, we recommend you to extract with CTAB and then to do an extra purification step. So for these type of samples that naturally contain more contaminants than others, you might benefit from doing uh, that extra purification. And then you need to consider uh, if you are working with a mixed sample, for instance, if you have a soil sample, you want to look at metagenomics. If you want to um, to see all the species that are present, or if you want to do some sort of depletion of some of those species, you need to, to consider that uh, in order to choose the best extraction method. And then once you have your extract, there are some uh, post-process 
post extraction processing you can do, uh, like versus size selection. So you might want to to fragment your sample a little bit to to generate shorter fragments. Uh, you might want to size select it to generate longer fragments, so to deplete the the shorter uh, material. Uh, and here it's important for you to know that there's a trade-off between sequencing output and read length. So you can play with uh, with a fragment length in order to to achieve uh, your goals. And then finally, you need to take into account if you want to multiplex your sample or, or not. So then you know how many you can pull, if you want to pull them uh, in a normalized way or not. And here, keep in mind that multiplexing kits do tend to have lower uh, input amounts. So this might be beneficial for you uh, if you have a lower input amount. And then when we are talking about uh, fragment uh, lengths, with the, with Oxford Nanopore technologies, you can you can sequence anything from twenty base pair all the way to megabase size. So when we talk about short fragments, so things down to twenty base pairs, usually we are talking about samples that are naturally fragmented, like for instance cell free DNA, and that's just how the sample is. You you can't do um, much about it. You can sequence it as it is, but when you have longer fragments, when you have a well preserved sample with longer fragments, then you can kind of uh, fragment or size select your sample to generate the type of fragments that you need to answer um, your questions. So for instance, if you're looking at methylation, you probably want to generate a lot of data and it doesn't have to be necessarily long. So you would be looking um, at something in the medium range, so up to 15 KB, and you would be maximizing the sequencing output. However, if you were looking at something like structural variance, for instance, you would want a good balance between sequencing output and read length because uh, you would want longer fragments, so fragments up to 50 KB. And then if you are looking uh, for instance, assemblies, you might want to look at ultra long fragments. So fragments above 50 KB up to megabase uh, size. So the current uh, record is four megabase. And I would love to see you uh, beat that record and achieve even longer fragments. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about sample handling and storage. Uh, and this is really important because you cannot sequence what you do not have. Uh, and this is our number one rule of extraction, extracting samples. Um, and this is because what, what you get out of the device regarding sequencing is what you put in. So if you wanna sequence uh, something that is really long, you need to ensure that those long fragments were carried from raw uh, sample through extraction, through library prep, all the way to our sequencing devices. So you need to have those fragments to start with. And that's why it's so important to ensure that your sample have been well preserved and that you handle your extracts in the best way possible. So just to give you a, a couple of examples regarding sample preservation, so prior to extraction, uh, on this first example, we use rabbit blood and we kept it at the room temperature and then at four degrees. Of course, that uh, I like to think that no one would keep uh, blood at room temperature for uh, several days. But this is just to illustrate what happens if you do that. So if you keep a sample um, in a condition that is not appropriate, the sample will degrade. So after seven days, the sample kept at room temperature had a lower N50 than the sample kept at four degrees. And the N50 was 15 KB lower, which is quite a lot. So your sample should not be kept at room temperature. Uh, as a general rule, they should be frozen. But then even when you freeze them, there might be certain changes. So in the second example with the, with the cells, they were all kept at minus 80 degrees, but some were kept dry, others in glycerol, and others in a mix of FPS and the MSO. And what we've seen is that the ones kept in FPS and the MSO actually had longer reads. So in this instance, it's not just the temperature, uh, the media where uh, the samples are stored will also make a difference. So as a general rule for both DNA and RNA, ideally you should keep them, should keep the samples at minus 80 to preserve integrity. 
Of course, that we are aware that sometimes you just don't have a minus 80 freezer because you are on the field or you are shipping samples to collaborators and it just don't have a minus 80 at hand. There are other solutions to keep your sample stable until you can uh, preserve it with the most appropriate way. So for instance, with, with RNA samples, you have um, the RNA later solution. Uh, if you're working with blood, you can uh, keep it in FTA cards. Uh, for RNA, you can use the, the Pax gene uh, blood tubes. When working with environmental samples of water and air, you can use the filters for soils or stool. You can dry them with uh, with silica beads so to, to ensure they won't get moldy until they reach the lab. For swabs, you have uh, the viral transport media. And these are only a few examples. So this is not an extensive list. It's just a few examples of the options you have available uh, on the market. So whatever your sample is, you will have uh, an alternative to keep the sample stable until you can take it to a lab and preserve it properly. Then when you actually do your extraction, uh, you also need to preserve the extracted material. And for DNA, we have done uh, a few studies. And um, what we what we realize is that 4 degrees, so that the fridge is, is fine for short-term storage. For long-term storage, it's much better to, to freeze the sample. It will just uh, retain most of the, the long fragments. So if you do want to keep it for a long period, um, freezing it would be the best option. Uh, we have seen uh, pretty much the same uh, for RNA. We have also seen that samples kept in water, um, they do tend to, to degrade a bit faster. So with, with RNA, uh, we measure the integrity by using the RIN, the RNA integrity number. And we've seen that samples kept in water, uh, the RIN uh, does uh, just suffer a bit uh, at long term. So we also recommend storing it um, in the freezer. Now, when you handle uh, DNA, if you want to preserve long fragments, you need to ensure that you're not shearing your sample, that you're not introducing any type of uh, physical shearing to it. So you should use uh, whiteboard tips and you should mix uh, gently but thoroughly by flicking the tube. So do not vortex, avoid vortexing and avoid pipette mixing, just, just flick the tube. We've also seen that if you freeze to your site, your sample, um, there will be a negative impact uh, on the, the read length. So after 10 freeze towing cycles, we have seen a drop on the read N50 of the samples. So it's important to avoid freeze towing cycles, long-term storage, to keep it on the on the freezer. If you think you're gonna use the same sample over and over again, it might be ideal to split it through different tubes to, to avoid that freeze thawing uh, cycles. Um, avoid exposing your sample to really high temperatures and to obviously introduce any DNases because that will degrade the sample. Uh, for RNA, we do recommend keeping it at, at minus eight, especially for long-term storage. Ideally, uh, you should keep the extracts in single-use uh, tubes. Uh, in the case of RNA, it's not just because you want to avoid free storing cycles, but mainly because you want to, to avoid introducing RNAs. And if you keep using the same tube over and over again, you're always opening and closing, uh, and you are more likely to introduce RNAs in your sample. This is something you really want to avoid. Um, it's usually good practice to treat the samples with RNAs. So either um, either during the extraction or after, um, when you already have uh, your extract, you should ensure all, all surfaces are clean and there are um, commercially available solutions for that. And it's also good practice to keep the samples on ice. Uh, avoid as much as possible the free storing cycles. Uh, variation on temperature, especially high temperature, and keep your samples in an appropriate solution. Now let's go uh, into choosing the right extraction method, depending on what you have. We're gonna start with DNA. And um, there are there are a lot of available kits. Um, several of them 
will um, extract different type of samples. So starting with cultural cells, blood and, blood and tissues, you need to think first um, about the, the fragments, the type of fragments you want to generate. If you are looking to something that is short or medium, then something like the, the CHIAMP um, kits, so this is kind of a, a range of kits, um, they will, usually you wouldn't require any further processing because the CHIAMP kits are based uh, on spin columns. So they will shear the, the sample um, a little bit. So if you are looking to fragments that are short or medium, odds are you won't have to process your sample any further. If you want to use uh, something on the range of pure gene and genomic tip, again, several kits uh, available, depending on the sample type, you might have to fragment your sample uh, because these kits tend to generate, uh, tend to retrieve DNA that is a bit longer. If you do want to look at uh, long fragments, so things up to 50 uh, KB, you can use uh, the same pure gene and chiagen genomic tip, uh, and you can combine them with size selection. So if you have a considerable amount of short fragments, you might benefit to, uh, from a depletion of those, so to size select it. Uh, there's also the NAB monarch kits. These might require fragmentation, especially if you are using a ligation approach, because they do tend to generate quite long uh, DNA. And um, when you are looking at these methods, you should take into account certain uh, specific characteristics your samples might have. Like, for instance, if you are working with the, with lizards or with chicken that have nucleative uh, red blood cells, you're going to be um, getting a lot of DNA from a very tiny amount of blood. So make sure that you know how, how your sample is going to perform. Make sure you have an idea of that, because with these type of samples, you would have to dilute them before uh, extracting. So make sure you know uh, about this. Uh, and then also this type of general methods, they can be used to, to other samples like fruit flies or, or worms. Then if you are working with samples that have uh, tough cell walls, uh, there's a, a few that uh, fit in here. So with plants, as, as I mentioned before, um, it's something that might have some contaminants that are naturally present. So we recommend extracting with a CTAP based method and then uh, doing uh, a purification with a chiagen uh, genomic tip column, which is kind of similar uh, to what we recommend for instance for mushrooms that we, we recommend a nuclei purification and then um, the same purification with a column. If you are working with yeasts, uh, those do tend to have a very tough wall. So we, uh, we recommend uh, PVP and SDS uh, based lysis and then followed by precipitation and washes. For bacteria, both gram positive and gram negative, we've tested uh, the chiagen genomic tip, um, also the pure gene uh, kit for bacteria and the chiagen maggot tract, and they all work uh, perfectly. They do have the result uh, in material with different characteristics, but all of this data is available in, in our community page, so you can go there and check it out. Uh, when working with environmental samples, we recommend bead beating uh, base methods if you want to extract everything that is present. So if you want to do some sort of, uh, of depletion, um, either by host or bacteria, there are uh, methods that will allow you to, uh, to achieve that. Um, again, they're also available on the community. And when you're not sure of what's in your sample and you want to extract everything, a bead beating method is always the safest option because if you are using enzymes, uh, they won't necessarily uh, lyse all the walls or the walls of all species the same way. So if you don't know what's in there and you want to see all the species you have, bead beating would be uh, the best the best option. Then there are a few. Um, a few samples that are uh, a little bit more specific and that required uh, specific kits, like for instance, FFP samples, uh, cell-free DNA, uh, and then plasmids as well. These, these are samples that we, um, we recommend people uh, to use uh, specific kits. And then something like, for instance, blood spots on, on FTA cards, we have validated it with, uh, with a chiagen easy to device. These type of samples can be extracted with, with other kits, like for instance, a MAGA tract kit. 
for for RNA, um, unlike DNA, where you have a kit that can extract ten different type of samples, with RNA, most commercial kits tend to be specific uh, for uh, certain samples. So we have uh, validated uh, the formic pure for FFP samples. Uh, for blood, we recommend um, the Paxgen blood RNA kit, and we've also validated the Paxgen blood collection kits along with it. Uh, specifically for blood, we recommend uh, a pre -pro a post processing of the sample. Sorry, once you extract your RNA, we recommend you to do a globin depletion step, and this is because if you extract RNA um, from blood and you sequence it as it is, most of your reads will be hemoglobin, which is probably something you're not particularly interested on. So if that's the case, you can just do this globin depletion step. Then for cell lines, the method we recommend is trisol, which is also recommended for other things like worms, uh, yeast. Uh, and this is because trisol can be widely used in a variety of, of samples. We um we know that some, some users um, don't necessarily like to use uh, trisol due to environmental reasons. And that's why we validated um, commercial kits as an alternative, but you can indeed use trisol with, the, with a variety of samples. So we've tried them, the spectrum plant total kit uh, for plants. Uh, for animal tissues, we recommend an origin animal tissue RNA purification kit. And for mushrooms, we have uh, validated the Kyogen RNAZ plant mini kit. And then finally, um, we've tested a couple of kits for uh, bacteria and we recommend pure link for gram negative and rival pure for gram positive. If you are working with RNA uh, from bacteria, please keep in mind that you should do uh, a rival RNA depletion um, using the rival minus kit and then polyadenylation because you will need to poly uh, the bacteria before you can sequence it. All of these protocols are also available on our community. Now, there are a few post-extraction uh, recommendations we have. So I've, I've mentioned about fragmentation uh, and fragmentation uh, can be used uh, for several reasons. The first one is to optimize the sequencing output. So as I said, there is a, a little trade-off between sequencing output and read length. So you might want to fragment your sample a little bit to generate more data, depending on uh, your aim. It can be particularly useful if you have uh, less than recommended input amount, because obviously you will be able to increase the molarity if you reduce uh, the fragment size. So if you have less than um, the amount we recommend, you can just shear it down to ensure um, it will be enough. You can also fragment to generate optimal uh, fragment lengths for ligation. So if your um, if your fragments are really 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 long, um, they might not um, be very efficient on a ligation uh, preparation. So you might benefit from fragmenting them a little bit just to make sure that you have that efficiency during your library preparation. Then. Sometimes the high molecular weight DNA can be quite viscous. So you might want to fragment it a little bit just to make it easier to handle. Uh, and then we do have our uh, rapid uh, chemistry that will fragment the sample. So it is transposase based um, and just just a rapid library um, as it is. It takes about 10 minutes, so it's, it's quite fast. And it's ideal to um, to work with certain samples. So for instance, if you're working with plasmids, you have to linearize uh, the molecules. So with a rapid approach, the kit will do it for you. So you have no need to linearize the molecules and then do a library preparation. You can just do a rapid uh, library on your samples and that will linearize it for you. So you can just sequence it as it is. And this transposase-based uh, chemistry is also used on ultra-long uh, kit, so the one that will allow you to reach megabase size uh, reads. It's also based um, on this fragmentation. So if you want to fragment your DNA before um, the library, so if you're not using uh, a rapid approach, uh, one of the methods we use in-house is the Megaraptor. So it's, it's a device that has uh, needles and basically it forces the, the DNA through goes through the needle at a given speed. 
So in this example, you can see that the sample that wasn't sheared actually has a lower N50 than some of the samples that were sheared. And this is because uh, it's one of those examples where the DNA was very long, so the ligation wasn't uh, really as efficient as it could have been. So it was uh, beneficial to shear the sample a little bit prior uh, to the library preparation. And then you can also use something like, for instance, a Covaris G-tube uh, that will result in this type of normal uh, distribution curve. Um, and usually you fragment from 6 to 20 kb. Uh, again, uh, at different speeds, you'll have uh, different profiles, but this is a, a very good alternative if you want to fragment your sample. Then um, there's also the, the size selection. It's also a, a good option if you want to deplete a short fragment. So in this instance, you can see our short fragment eliminator kit. And as you can see, when you use it, you lose all of those really short fragments. So if you want to get mainly uh, long data, this is a very good alternative to, to achieve that. There are other methods for size selection uh, that you can use. For instance, spry beads. We do have uh, on the community um, a custom solution we recommend when people want to um, enrich fragments above 1.5 kb. This is particularly useful if you are using uh, a rapid approach. When you are using a ligation kit uh, during the, the library preparation, you can use um, the, the long fragment buffer to wash your sample that will enrich for longer fragments. But if you're not using that uh, that kit, then the scribes could be a good alternative. We have also validated the Blue Pippin uh, device, uh, which is customizable. So you can enrich for things above 40 KB, which is quite a lot, but you can tune it for other uh, fragments. It does have the disadvantage that it requires uh, an investment because it, it is a device and um, it is a bit needy regarding samples. So you need something like five micrograms, which might be a bit uh, too much for some some people in some applications. And then there's also the option to do size selection by precipitation. So in this case, we've uh, we've also validated uh, a buffer that is based uh, on PVP. And you basically just, just precipitate your sample and then you wash it and you deplete most of the fragments below uh, 10 KB. Now regarding the sample QC, so once you extract your DNA and RNA, you need to QC it. The first thing we ask people to do is to check the yield of the extraction, so to check the, the concentration. Um, and uh, we, uh, we do this by using qubit, and we recommend people to use qubit for quantity and not nanodrop. So nanodrop is something we recommend to assess purity, but the ratios uh, are affected by contaminants. So if your extract is not really clean or is not totally clean, the, the concentration provided by nanodrop will be overestimated. Uh, we have tested the impact of uh, many contaminants on the ratios for both DNA and RNA. Again, all information available on the website. But here we have uh, just an example of how phenol can have an impact on the library preparation uh, efficiency. So if you have up to 1% uh, of phenol in your sample, your, your library preparation efficiency remains relatively stable, but above that, there's, there's a massive drop. So it's important to assess purity to ensure your sample doesn't have contaminants that would have an impact on the library preparation. And then finally, for, uh, for DNA, you need to assess the fragment length. So in this example, we have uh, the same sample being extracted with seven different methods. And as you can see, it has really different uh, fragment length profiles. So some are, are shorter, some are longer. And you need to, to know how your profile looks because you need to, to know if you need to fragment your sample, if you need to size select, if you don't need to do anything. And for you to know that, you need to know how the fragments look. Uh, there are other methods, so you don't need to use uh, just phantopoles. Just keep in mind that if you're using something like a gel, 
you should ensure that your ladder is um, bigger than your fragments because otherwise you won't be able to actually see the size and to know if you have to process your sample any further or not. Then when you are working with RNA, you check the integrity. Instead of you know looking at the length, you should be looking at the integrity of the, the RNA. And we do that by looking at the RIN, the RNA integrity number that is provided by uh, Agilent Bioanalyzer. Uh, the maximum is 10 closer to 10, uh, the better. And what we have seen is that different RINs are related uh, to different uh, read lengths. So the lower the RIN, the lower your uh, your read length is gonna be. So if you want full transcripts or as long as possible, you should ensure that you have a high RIN. So you should ensure that you extracted your sample with, with a good extraction method and that your sample was well preserved to start with and to uh, provide you RNA with a high integrity number. And then uh, finally, just to wrap it up, a practical example. Let's say you are interested in characterizing and phasing methylation across the whole human genome, starting from a blood sample. With nanopore sequencing, you can directly detect methylation without any special library preparation like bisulfite, and we have PCR-free options of library preparation to make sure you retain all the modifications in your sample. So for this experiment, we recommend the ligation sequencing kit. As mentioned earlier, when you are looking at methylation, maximizing read length isn't the most important thing, but if you want to phase your data, longer reads will really help with this process. So here we recommend over 20 kb. So for something like this, we would recommend to extract the blood sample with the Kyogen uh, Pure Gene Kit, which we know uh, will allow you to get really long fragments, uh, assuming your sample has been uh, well preserved and um, it works really well. So we expect you to have a high sequencing output as well. Um, it will allow you to get a good uh, yield from the extraction with good enough quality. Uh, there are other alternatives that we have validated. So here you have a few examples, uh, but for this particular workflow, we would uh, recommend Purgin because it has an, a very good balance uh, between long fragments and yield. And once you do your extraction, it would be ideal to do a size selection because you probably want to deplete everything um, that is below 10 kb because you want to privilege those those long fragments and you would probably benefit from doing uh, some fragmentation with a mega raptor so in this instance because you want to look at things above 20 kb we would not recommend using something like the covaris g2 so you would need to use a uh, needle shearing something like something like mega raptor and then you could have a normal distribution of your sample, which would be ideal to look at something like um, methylation phasing. Um, I mentioned throughout the presentation a couple of times, oh, we have uh, this available in the community. This is where you should go. We have 72 protocols, uh, 25 sample types. This includes both DNA and RNA, and we have uh, advice and uh, sample storage, handling, all that I mentioned regarding contaminants, it's all available in the community, so make sure you check it out. Uh, and just to, to wrap up, hopefully after this presentation, you have an idea of what you need to think before going into the lab, how your sample needs to look for you to achieve your goals. Uh, you should also have a better idea of how you should handle your samples, how you should store them, um, and you, as well as taking into account what, what you should think of when choosing um, a suitable extraction method. Um, hopefully you know how important it is to QC your samples and which parameters you should be looking at. And you should know how you should further manipulate your sample to make sure it looks uh, as it should for you to achieve your goals. I hope uh, this presentation was useful and thank you for watching.